Top 10 ways sugar ruins your health. Everybody knows by now that sugar is bad. And yet, we keep eating up to one third of our calories as added sugar. How can that be? Well, for two reasons. First, sugar is a drug. And secondly, we typically don't change our lifestyle until we have a health scare, until we have a symptom that frightens us, until we have a big enough reason. Well, I'm gonna give you the reasons. In this video, you will learn 10 mechanisms by which sugar does its damage so that you'll know for sure why you will wanna change before it's too late. Coming right up. Hey, I'm Dr. Eckberg. I'm a holistic doctor and a former Olympic decathlete. And if you want to truly master health by understanding how the body really works, make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell so that you don't miss anything. I want to start out with one of my favorite quotes. It's from Gary Tobe's book, The Case Against Sugar, and it says, We are beyond question the greatest sugar consumers in the world, and many of our diseases may be attributed to too free a use of sweet food. When I first read that quote, I thought, that makes a lot of sense. We eat tons and tons of sugar. But then I read under the quote, and it said, published in the New York Times on May 22nd, 1857. So we think that this is a modern problem and it's been going for a while but if they thought that it was a problem already in 1857 when we ate 20 pounds per year and they thought already it was contributing to a lot of disease then it certainly hasn't diminished by now because we consume about 150 pounds of added sugar per year. So in this video, we're not going to talk about every disease that you can get from sugar because it's virtually every disease there is. There's thousands and thousands and thousands. There's a list online that Nancy Appleton, she's been publishing books and she's been writing about sugar for a while. She has 146 peer-reviewed sources of diseases and cancer and so forth that are caused by sugar. And I'm sure that the list is growing. But like I said, it's pretty much every disease that you've ever heard of that has some link. So today we want to understand the mechanism. Why is sugar so bad? Why does it do the things it does? First of all, reason number one, sugar is empty calories. That means that when you eat food, your body expects a certain amount of nutrients. It wants the fuel, it wants the calories, which comes from carbohydrate or protein or fat, but it also expects some vitamins and some minerals and some essential fatty acids and some essential amino acids and some enzymes and so forth. And sugar has none of that. It has absolutely zero of all those things. So this results in malnutrition and deficiencies. And what is a deficiency? It means that in order for your body to perform its functions, it needs certain things. If it doesn't get the things it needs, it can't perform the function. That's what deficiency is. And in extreme cases, we get symptoms and disease, but long, long, long before that, we have diminished function, we have diminished vitality, diminished quality of life. Reason number two, it causes mineral depletion. And this is kind of a triple whammy. I think you've heard how important minerals are by now, but it does this three different ways. It messes with our minerals. First, it decreases the absorption. Secondly, it increases the excretion. Okay. So first, we take up less, we get rid of more, but then the third reason comes back to the malnutrition, that in order for you to process, in order for you to metabolize those calories, you need certain nutrients. You need minerals like chromium, copper, zinc, and magnesium, and if they don't come in the food, in the sugar, but the sugar provides a the sugar creates a need for it, then it depletes us of those minerals. 
So it's a triple whammy. There's three different ways. So for minerals, sugar is a really bad idea. Reason number three, sugar decreases your immunity, your immune function, your ability to resist infection. Because when blood glucose goes up, the activity of your white blood cells go down. The white blood cells are the, the cell-based immunity, the, the cells that fight off pathogens and foreign invaders. And the higher the glucose, the less the activity of the white blood cells. Number four, sugar creates unstable blood sugar. Your body likes blood sugar to be stable especially the brain. The brain loves stable blood sugar when the sugar is high, that's toxic to the brain. When the blood sugar is low, that is toxic to the brain. Either one can result in a coma. When it's really low, it's called hypoglycemia. And when you eat something like protein or fat or vegetables with fiber, then your blood sugar stays very, very stable. But when you eat sugar, blood sugar starts going up and down, up and down. And this results in cravings. If blood sugar goes really high and then insulin pushes it down, it will have a tendency to go too low into hypoglycemia. And now you have hunger, cravings, irritability, lack of focus, because your brain doesn't have any fuel. And then the intuitive thing seems to be to eat more sugar because that's what the brain says. Hey, we're having a crisis, give me some sugar, and that's where you get cravings. But that's the worst thing you can do is to eat sugar because it just perpetuates the pattern of that roller coaster blood sugar. So with unstable blood sugar, with a roller coaster of glucose, you're gonna have energy and no energy, energy and no energy. And you're gonna have cravings and you're gonna have an overall greater hunger. But because glucose is also a drug, it's gonna start affecting your mood. You're gonna have, you're gonna feel good. Sugar stimulates serotonin, which is a feel good hormone. The brain has opioid receptors, drug receptors for sugar. So when you eat some sugar, you trigger more serotonin, you feel good, but again, you're setting yourself up for a roller coaster and then it's gonna drop and now you feel terrible. So your mood is gonna follow that roller coaster as well. So all 10 of these mechanisms are profound. They can be devastating for your health, but I've still try to order them in the order of how profound their impact is. One, on the degree of scariness, and secondly, on how many people are affected, how many people in the world are dying from this today. So now we get to number five, and now we're getting to the really scary stuff, cancer. Cancer doesn't like an environment with low blood sugar. So if you do something like a long-term fast where your blood glucose goes really low and your ketones come up to a level that's about equal to your glucose, now cancer really doesn't like it. Cancer really likes that high blood sugar because it's growing so fast and it utilizes primarily glycolysis, meaning its primary source of energy is to break down sugar into energy. Most of your other cells in the body like fat, where they can use oxygen and sort of burn more slowly. But cancer loves to go really, really fast and they thrive on what's called a glycolytic metabolism. So when you keep your sugars low, and especially during a long fast with autophagy and high ketones, then you will have one of your best tools to inhibit cancer. Number six, sugar causes a dysregulation of hormones and neurotransmitters. So basically, hormones determine everything about how your body does what it does, your sex hormones, your energy hormones, etc. And neurotransmitters affect your immediate behavior, how you feel and how signals are transmitted in your body. So on the hormone side of things, we have things like PCOS, polycystic ovary syndrome, which is linked to tremendous uh, menstrual pains and infertility 
and it is very, very strongly linked to hormones which are upset by sugar and insulin. In men, it can create things like man boobs. This is a whole new concept, moobs. It hardly existed a few decades ago and now it's becoming almost the norm as people's endocrine system, as their hormones are all over the place and sugar is probably at the root of that. Other problems can be things like erectile dysfunction in men and decreased libido in women. Because it dysregulates neurotransmitters, we also have sugar strongly linked to things like depression and anxiety, attention deficit disorder, and in kids especially, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Number seven, sugar causes inflammation. It causes a low-grade chronic inflammation. And what's wrong with that? Low-grade chronic inflammation is linked to every degenerative disease that we know of. Cardiovascular disease, stroke, Alzheimer's, you name it. Uh, Low-grade chronic inflammation is involved in that disease process, in that premature aging process. And sugar is at the root of that. Number eight, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Used to be almost unknown, but it is increasing at an alarming rate along with obesity, diabetes, and abdominal weight gain. And it used to be associated with people who got older, who got into their 50s and 60s, but today we're starting to see this more and more even in teens or even pre-teens. When we have infant formula with high fructose corn syrup and when parents put Coca-Cola in the baby bottle, we're starting to abuse the system to such an enormous degree right from the beginning of life that the body has no chance to withstand that. We break down early, early on. And why is fructose so critical in that? Because sugar is 50% fructose, 50% glucose. In nature, fructose and glucose occurs in very, very small amounts. But when we concentrate it, when we refine it, when we extract the sugar from wherever it was growing, it's like we're refining a drug. Poppy is a plant, but we can take poppy and concentrate it and turn it into opium or even heroin. And then it becomes thousands or millions times more addictive and that's how it works with sugar as well. So in plants, if you eat broccoli or lettuce, there's going to be some fructose and glucose and sucrose in there. But when you refine it, you break all the rules, you change everything. So if you eat 100 grams of sugar, which is less than the average person eats in a day, you're getting 50 grams of glucose that can be metabolized by every cell in the body. So I'm about 180 pounds, so those 50 grams of glucose are spread out over 180 pounds of cells. But the fructose can only be absorbed and processed and metabolized by the liver. So now we have 50 grams of fructose, the same amount that was spread out over 180 pounds of body weight, now has to be processed by three pounds of liver. So we're force feeding the liver 60 times more sugar, 60 times more concentrated than the glucose in the rest of the body. One comparison is in foie gras, which is the French word for liver pâté. And gras means fat and foie means liver, so it's basically a fatty liver that they're talking about. And this is a delicacy, but it's quite barbaric in how they produce it because they have to force feed the geese or the duck. And normally animals in the wild and humans who eat real food, they have hunger to regulate how much they eat. But when you force feed them, you overwhelm their metabolism, you overwhelm their organ, you're stuffing that liver full. And it's kind of what we're doing when we eat fructose is we're force feeding our liver. We're just stuffing that liver full of way more than it can handle. And it results in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, 
which is one very large step toward type 2 diabetes. And again, why is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease such a big deal? Well, think about the word liver. The first four letters in the word liver is live, all right? It's kind of important. So as if that wasn't enough reasons, we now get to the really big ones. Number nine, sugar feeds pathogens. It feeds opportunistic pathogens. It feeds everything that you don't want in your body loves sugar. So we're talking about yeast, bacteria, fungus, and parasites primarily. And these guys are not necessarily bad. We have them in our bodies at all time. We couldn't live without them, but they need to be maintained in balance. When we have a certain percentage of beneficial that offset a certain number of pathogenic, then we have the optimum health. It's not like we want zero of the pathogenic. Everything exists in a balance. But when we eat sugar, we upset that balance. We selectively feed the pathogenic ones and they proliferate and they start producing toxins. And now we have an unbalanced gut flora that those toxins can lead to leaky gut. And leaky gut is one of the steps toward autoimmunity. It's one of the, the major components of autoimmunity. So now we're talking about hypothyroid, we're talking about cerebellar autoimmunity, pancreatic autoimmunity, uh, type 1 diabetes possibly, and type 1.5 diabetes, which is when you start off as a type 2, but then there's an autoimmune process that takes you to type 1 as well. And then of course we have to throw in at the end here caries or cavities. When your teeth get cavities or they rot, that used to be like the number one overwhelming, overshadowing reason to tell kids don't eat sweets, don't eat sugar because you get cavities. Well, it is a real problem, but it's sort of dwarfed in the, in the enormity of all the other things that, that sugar does. But sure enough, cavities are a result of bacteria that feed on sugar and that create acid that destroy your teeth. So one more reason. And number 10, not because it's the scariest, because it doesn't scare people enough, but sugar promotes insulin resistance. It does it in two ways. It does it through fructose and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and then it does it through unstable blood sugar. When we constantly put in a lot of glucose, a lot of blood sugar, we trigger insulin and insulin over time, high insulin over time creates insulin resistance. So a combination of blood glucose and fatty liver will produce insulin resistance, which is tied to virtually every degenerative condition that we know of. So the obesity and the weight gain epidemic, the reason that weight can be so stubborn is because of insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is synonymous. It is the same thing as type 2 diabetes. Insulin resistance and sugar will lead to a decreased HDL and it will lead to an increased LDL. And when we say increased LDL, we're talking about the harmful uh, L type of LDL, the small and oxidized LDL. So again, there's not really good or bad LDL, there's just a good or bad balance. And the balance you're looking for is the opposite. You're looking for high HDL and lower of the small oxidized LDL. And sugar pushes this in the wrong direction. But cholesterol isn't even as strong an indicator of heart disease as triglycerides are. And sugar will push triglycerides up. Why? Because when you're insulin resistant and you eat carbohydrate, your blood sugar goes up, your insulin goes up, the insulin tries to get the sugar into the cell, but the cell doesn't want it. Now the high blood sugar is still a crisis. The body has to get it down, but the cell doesn't want it. So the only other thing the body can do is to convert the glucose into triglycerides. That's what insulin does. Insulin promotes 
lipogenesis. It takes excess sugar and turns it into fat, and now that fat is floating around in the bloodstream as triglycerides. And what people notice, the very first thing when they go on a fast or a ketogenic diet, is that even though they eat tons and tons and tons of fat, the triglycerides, the fat in the blood, goes down. Because when insulin goes down, then the body can use the fat and there is no sugar that they have to turn into triglycerides. Next we have what's called type 3 diabetes. And this is a new concept, but it is known as Alzheimer's or dementia. And the reason they call it type 3 diabetes is that your brain also gets insulin resistant. And when the brain gets insulin resistant, then it can't access the glucose. It can't get the fuel properly. And there's such a strong link between insulin resistance and dementia that they now call it type 3 diabetes. Insulin resistance also promotes something called metabolic syndrome or syndrome X, which is a combination. It's like a group name of all the different things we've talked about on this topic. And the last one is the hypertension, that people get high blood pressure when they have metabolic syndrome. And again, it's the insulin resistance that's driving. It's the sugar that's driving this hypertension, high blood pressure. And hypertension has been called the silent killer. But if you really want to find out what the silent killer is, of course, it is sugar. It's what we've been talking about here because you eat sugar and it feels good and you think it's food and nobody tells you really how it works. And in the end, you end up with all of this. Sugar is the silent killer. So right here at the end, we're going to include two bonuses because so far we've talked about the 10 mechanisms by which sugar does its damage. But even then, it's sometimes not strong enough a reason for people to change. So we're going to go to the one thing that people care about the most, which is how they look and wrinkles. All right. So the first bonus, this is called age, which stands for advanced glycation end products. And these are proteins and fats that swim around with a lot of sugar in the bloodstream and they combine, they clump together. And this end product is very, very damaging. And it has been linked to all sorts of degeneration and inflammation, but it also damages the protein collagen and elastin. And these are the proteins that maintain firmness and elasticity of the skin. So when sugar damages these two proteins through the process of age, now we get more saggy skin and more wrinkles. So as we age, this is somewhat inevitable, but by reducing the sugar, you can ward it off as long as possible. And the last item on the list is that sugar is addictive. Okay? If you want to be in control of your life, you don't want sugar. Sugar is the thing that gives you the cravings. It gives you the mood swings. It makes you eat more frequently. It makes you eat too much. Sugar is one of the most addictive substances that we know of. So not only does it create all of these different problems, but it creates an increased need for itself. It feeds itself in a vicious cycle. That's what drugs do. The more you have, the more you want. And they're even playing on this in the commercials, but it is a serious problem. Sugar is a drug and people have a different tendency to get addicted. And if you are really, really strongly addicted, then it's like an alcoholic. You can't have just a little bit. But if you understand that it's a drug, then you can start doing something about it. And if you understand what the mechanisms are, how profound the damage can be, now you'll have some motivation to fuel you and make those changes. I hope I've given you enough reasons to understand that when it comes to health, sugar is the root of all evil. If you enjoyed this video, then make sure you check out that one. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.